the recorded version is will be made available at the section website and the section YouTube channel. So with this, I'll hand it to you, Furkan, to introduce our distinguished speaker. Thank you, Hamid Reza. And uh, welcome, Professor Madard. Allow me to introduce you to our uh, attendees here. And I'm going to read through her bio. Professor Muriel Medar is the Cecil H. and Ida Green Professor in the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department at MIT, where she leads the Network Coding and Reliable Communications Group in the Research Laboratory for Electronics at MIT. She has obtained three bachelor's degrees, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, Mathematics and Humanities, as well as her Master of Science and SCD, all from MIT. She is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, a fellow of the U.S. National Academy of Inventors, and a fellow of the IEEE. She was elected president of the IEEE Information Theory Society in 2012 and served on its board of governance for 11 years. She holds an honorary doctorate from the Technical University of Munich. She was co-winner of the MIT 2004 Harold Egerton Faculty Achievement Award and was named a Gilbert Lecturer by the U.S. National Academy of Engineering in 2007. She received the 2017 IEEE Communication Society Edwin Howard Armstrong Achievement Award and the 2016 IEEE Vehicular Technology James Evans Avant Garde Award. She received the 2019 Best Paper Award for IEEE Transactions on Network Science and Engineering, the 2018 ACM Sick Contest of uh, Time Paper Award, the 2009 IEEE Communication Society and Information Theory Society Joint Paper Award, the 2009 Viable a William Bennett Prize in the field of communications networking, the 2002 IEEE Leon uh, Kirschmeier Prize Paper Award, as well as eight conference paper awards. Most of her prize papers are co-authored with uh, her students from her group. She has served as a technical committee co-chair of ISIT, Connext, YAPT, WCNC, and of many workshops. She has chaired the IEEE Medals Committee and served as member and chair of many committees, including the chair of Milley Dressel House Medal. She was the editor-in-chief of the IEEE Journal on Selected Areas in Communications and has served as editor or guest editor of many IEEE publications, including IEEE Transactions on Information Theory, IEEE Journal of Lightweight Technology, IEEE Transactions on Information Forensics and Security. She was a member of the inaugural steering committees for the IEEE Transactions on Network Science and for the IEEE Journal on Selected Areas in Information Theory. Muriel received the inaugural 2013 MIT EECS Graduate Student Association Mentor Award voted by the students. She set up the Women uh, in the Information Theory Society and Information Theory Society Mentoring Program, for she was recognized with the 2017 Aaron Weiner Distinguished Service Award. She served as an undergraduate faculty in residence for seven years in two MIT dormitory, and she was elected by the faculty and served as a member of uh, and later chair of the MIT Faculty Committee on Student Life, and as uh, inaugural chair of the MIT Faculty Committee on Campus Planning. She was chair of the Institute Committee on Student Life. She was recognized as Siemens Outstanding Mentor for her work with the high school students. She served on the board of trustees since 2015 of the International School of Boston, for, she, for which she is treasurer. She has over 50 US and international patents awarded, the vast majority of which have been licensed or acquired. For technology transfer, she has co-founded two companies, Codon, for which she consults, and Steinberg, for which she is the chief scientist. Muriel has supervised over 40 master's students, over 20 doctoral students, and over 25 postdoctoral fellows. In addition to these, I should add that recently Muriel is also elected to the American Arts of Sciences in 2021. Um, thank you, Muriel. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for such a kind introduction, Furkan. And good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining me. And uh, Bonne soirée, puisque c'est le, le chapitre, le chapitre Montréal. Donc, Montréal, c'est... Uh, mais on va faire ça en anglais. OK. Uh, thank you all very much. Um, so, let, uh, you will have to be very um, patient with me as I navigate um, 
a WebEx because I am quite used to Zoom where I have been teaching amply for the last year. Uh, and so as I basically bungle around, uh, I'll ask for your indulgence. All right, let's see if I can do this. Right now you're the presenter. Is that working? Let's um, see. Partially. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, it is working. All that right. Great. Fantastic. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you all very much. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, universal noise centric decoding, and I'm delighted that uh, there are people in the audience I recognize, and of course, Frank and uh, himself, uh, who who have. Um, also been uh, looking at this problem with, and uh, everything that I'm presenting today is uh, joint work uh, with Ken Duffy. He uh, he was thinking of staying up until some ridiculous hour. He's in Ireland, but uh, he, he he instead just sends his good wishes. Um, so what do we mean by universal noise centric decoding? Why are we looking at the noise when usually the noise is what we want not to look at, what we want to try to get rid of? All right. Okay, so um, I'm trying to motivate a bit while we're taking this very different view uh, to a problem that of coding, which always seems to be um, completely solved and then something new sh shows up, right? So this, this is always a story of coding. It's been solved and been solved and then, oh, wait, no, it hasn't been solved. Something new shows up. Um, one of the current uh, motivations right now for revisiting the problem of coding is really uh, that the requirements that are emerging for communication systems are not anymore just around throughput and just reliability, but they're also around managing delay, low latency communications. Um, and basically, the, uh, the requirements of ultra reliability and low latency really seem at first to be at odds with each other. The first part, ultra reliability, is generally obtained by having coding at the physical layer. And we usually associate coding at the physical layer with, you know, long codes, with having, um, uh, with having um, interleaving, averaging over long periods of time. The longer, the better. The longer you, you, you make your code, the more averaging you have, the more you go towards uh, a concentration to the mean. And so it seems to be entirely at odd with the second part of, uh, of our requirements or desiderata, which is low latency. Okay, so how am I going to have something which is getting reliability by having very long transmissions and still have low latency? The two seem to be clashing with each other. Okay, so the general approach that we have been uh, taking, I would argue, has been just to add more spectrum. So the idea is I'm going to do what I was doing before, but because I want to go faster, I'm just going to do it at a higher sampling rate. So it's just like, you know, I'm, I'm speeding up. It's like I, I put everything on fast forward. You know, I, I basically compare it like drinking coffee or basically that spectrum used to be things faster with more energy and it's the same thing you're doing maybe not the smartest thing uh, but you're doing it faster and it's definitely costing you more energy and it's not just energy that it costs uh i mean anybody can look at the latest uh, spectrum auction um which was you know nearing a hundred billion dollars uh to see that you know this is really very very expensive of course that's not the only reason why people add, add spectrum uh but it definitely is one of the reasons. Okay, so um, I mentioned uh, that we are looking at noise and that's usually not what we look at. What do we usually look at? Well, we usually look at data because we're trying to transmit data. Uh, we're not trying to worry about the noise. The noise is just a nuisance. Uh, and what do we mean when we talk about coding? There's sort of two different parts of coding, but I'm going to argue we really need to look at them as just representing the same type of phenomena. The first part of coding is what we call compression or source coding. We take data, there is redundancy in the data, and that means that we're able to represent it in a more compact form. So, for instance, I may use gzip when I send a, a, a file. Uh, I may use maybe uh, some different kind of compression, maybe for video or maybe using um, uh, MPEG or whatever it may be. Uh, but basically, I am 
taking the data and representing it in an equivalent or almost equivalent way by doing compression slash source coding. And in the case that I have here, I imagine that each of these blocks is 100 bits. So I have a 400 bit block. Um, maybe my, uh, my rate to which I can compress uh, is a half. So I can go down to just two blocks of 100 bits each. Okay. Uh, sorry. All right. Okay. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, that's going to be my channel coding. Then in my channel coding, uh, I'm, uh, I'm then going to, uh, so that's going to be my data. And then I'm going to add some channel coding. And the reason I'm going to add some channel coding is because uh, I need uh, to add some redundancy. Now, you know, sometimes when, when I describe this to people outside the area, I go, okay, Muriel, you had redundancy, you took it out. And then you're adding it again. Why did you just not take out as much redundancy in the first place? It's a good question. Sometimes maybe you can just leave a little bit of the natural occurring redundancy. But the reason why we add this redundancy is because what we're trying to do is we're really trying to add um, redundancy that's going to be useful. And what do we mean by useful? It means that it's going to allow the data to uh, counteract, sustain, uh, some amount of uh, deleterious effects, which usually come from the channel. So we, we send the data over the channel transmission. You see this, this middle block here is, uh, is been shown as a little light. It means that somehow it's been affected. It's been affected by noise and the channel decoding tries to reconstruct the original transmitted data from the, the corrupted data that comes out of the channel. And then you do uh, source decoding, you recover the original data, whether it be the original file, the original movie, whatever it may be that was being transmitted. Okay, so this is basically the, uh, the cycle of coding. Okay, so um, I'm gonna be looking today uh, more at uh, channel coding, again, though again, we'll be coming back to this idea of source coding in a bit. Um, let's uh, try to remember how it is that actually originally uh, Shannon in 1948 told us to do um, to do the, the coding. Well, the way he told us to do the coding, so mapping from that dark brown to that light brown uh, the data is the following. He said, this is how I'm going to do it. I am going to take a very large N. So I'm going to take lots and lots and lots of those blocks. And I'm going to pick two to the n of the possible strings uniformly at random. So in the example that I had here, suppose that each of these was 100. So I'm I have 200 bits and I'm mapping them onto 300 bits. Okay. So my rate is a rate two thirds. Okay. One third of the data that I'm sending is redundant data. Okay. So a uh, number of possible messages that I had was two to the n. So it was two to the 200. And I'm mapping those out of uh, to uh, bits, uh, bit strings of like 300. So there's two to the 300 possible uh, 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 channel transmissions. But of course, I'm only choosing channel transmissions according to uh, the original dark brown. So out of two to the 200. Okay. So basically, in the example that I gave you, this two to the n here is to the um, uh, two to the uh, three hundred. This two to the n r is two to the two hundred because r is two thirds. Okay, and the way that he suggested to do this mapping is the following: I take a bag with my two to the three hundred possibilities. Okay, of code words. These are two to the three hundred possibilities of length like three hundred bits strings and I go into the bag, I pull out a code word and I assign a code word to that code word to the first message, to the first out of the two to the 200 possible transmitted data uh, strings. And then I say, okay, I've remembered that this to this bit, this uh, bit string of length 200 goes with this code word of length 300. I make a note of it and I put the code word back in the bag. Then I take the next 200 length bit string. I take at random uniformly another length 300 bit string and I put those together. I make a note of what I assign to what and I keep doing that. Now I'm doing a replacement, right? There's a slight probability I could even get two different um, 
uh, two different length 200 code uh, messages with the same length 300 code word, but it's very, very small. Okay. And then I transmit this over the channel and the channel is going to take these bits and is randomly going to flip some of those bits on the length 300 uh, code word that I sent. And then the receiver is going to take uh, a good hard look at this and is going to say, okay, Given what I see that I received, out of all the possible two to the 200 messages that were sent, given that I know how they were assigned to code words, which one is the most likely? Okay, now I'm assuming here that all the messages have the same probability uh, because, and we'll see later why that's, that's reasonable, all the messages have the same probability, which means that even though normally we think, okay, I'm doing a maxima posteriori, it becomes a maximum likelihood because I really don't need to take into account the prior uh, probability of the different messages of the different length 200 bit strings. Okay, now this is not what we do. This is absolutely not what we do. Instead, what we do is we construct codes. And I mentioned that, you know, coding is one of those things that looks like it's, you know, dying, then it comes back and it dies, it comes back. Okay. Why does it do this? Um, it does this because it tends to have, um, it tends to have uh, progress in sort of uh, non-linear jumps, okay? Of course, there's a lot of improvements once a new family of codes comes along. There's a lot of work, a lot of refinement, but there seem to be these sort of discontinuities, and then these discontinuities lead to a lot of follow-on work, and then there's another discontinuity, and because these discontinuities are so difficult to predict, because almost by definition, they're, they're weird, they're not, they're, they're, they're not in line with what already has been done, it's a little bit difficult to, um, to predict. Uh, so, you know, in the 1950s, you have block codes where you're taking uh, linear mapping, so using matrices to map from these length 200 strings through these length 300 strings. You could use, you know, um, basically uh, feedback shift registers. That's what convolutional codes are. They're still linear, but they, they, they have a somewhat different construction, a little easier. So-called modern codes, I put them between um, quotation marks because you have turbo codes appearing in the, uh, the 90s. Again, that's a big discontinuity, but then people recall that in the 60s, uh, Gallagher had actually shown low density parity check codes, and so they're called modern, even though, you know, clearly if it was done in the 60s, it's not that modern. Uh, at the network level, there are weightless codes, network codes, which I'm not going to talk about. And then again, another discontinuity uh, happens in uh, in 2009 with uh, Erdal Arakan showing polar codes, and several of the people who are uh, attending today actually had a big role in really showing uh, how to make Pratova really implement these polar codes. Okay, so let's go back to this uh, to this principles of coding. So. I'm just looking at the same picture. I'm just adding. Uh, I'm just adding a few variables. So I'm going to call S my uh, my source data here, uh, and this jump here to going from 400 bits to 200 bits. This compression, the source coding, where I reduced by 50%, uh, compacted basically the data by, by a factor of two. It's because I have an entropy, this is a Shannon entropy, which we denote with a letter H. I have an entropy of one half, say, you know, maybe maybe it's less, but let's say it's one half, okay? Uh, and this data here that I did uh, after that I got from compression that then I expanded back again through uh, channel coding with a rate R, which in this case was uh, was two thirds, is giving me an input to the channel, which we generally denote by X. Okay. The effect of the channel, which I mentioned before, you know, this set of uh, random bit flips, we usually denote by an additive noise. So if I'm in a Galois field of size two, uh, flipping a bit is adding is adding a noise of one and not flipping a bit is adding a noise of zero. Okay, so we can def we can look at things like bit flips. Of course, we can look at much more complicated uh, and interesting models, but for the time being, just for the sake of our conversation, uh, let's let's stick with with bits because it's a little easier to to discuss that. Okay, and this uh, this uh, bit flip process, which I'm defining as a noise, I'm going to denote by n. Okay, so. Um, what does it mean here when I do this compression? What it means is that even though I had two to the 400 
uh, possibilities originally, because I had length 400 um, string here, I had four chunks of 100, they were really only with high probability two to the 200 strings that I really needed to worry about. And therefore, I can make a more compact representation with just 200 strings. Okay. Uh, what does it mean here? Let me, I'm, I'm abusing a bit N because N here is this, whereas um, whereas uh, N here is is this N, but the, you know I don't want to have two ends running around, so let's just let's just be uh, um, flexible here with our with our notation, so I don't have to have two ends running around. Here I have a length uh, two to the three hundred possibilities. I have two to the uh, I have a length three hundred so um, string, so I have two to the three hundred poss uh, possibilities nominally, but actually I only have again two to the two hundred possibilities. Or so I have two to the NR strings, right? So basically what I'm saying is even though I have a longer string than I need, I only have within that a subset of the possibilities. Okay, so that's what we're using in channel coding, in, in source coding, and we're using it in reverse in channel coding. So here I'm going to, from sparse to uh, compact, and here I'm going from compact to sparse. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm going to send this along this channel, which has this additive noise. Now, let's think of this noise. If somebody gave me the noise, okay, if somebody gave me the noise and they said, you know, what is the shortest representation, Muriel, that you can find of this noise? I would say, well, okay, um, it's a little funny that you want to represent the noise, but never mind. Uh, I would do source coding just like I did here for the source. I would take the noise and uh, even though you know, every there are all kinds of possible bits uh, that can be affected in this example that I have given this 300 bits. Really, even though you have noise sequences of length 300, I only need to worry about two to the NHN of them, right? So if I were to represent in a compact fashion, if I were to represent in a compact fashion the, the, the noise, it would only have two to the NHN possibilities, okay? Now, my channel output, of course, here, length 300, is going to be 2 to the n. Okay, again, mind, as I said, just be flexible on the n. I'm talking about this n here, of the, the, the x. All right, so what do I try to do? I'm looking at this channel output, and remember that my, my, my idea for decoding is I'm going to stare at the channel output for as long as I need until I manage with high probability to reconstruct what the input was. All right. What is the nicest thing the noise could ever do to me? The nicest thing that the noise could ever do to me is that is that for it to compress itself and just to append itself to the end of the beginning or someplace, some prearranged place in my transmission. And the transmission, which you know was of length 300, but really only needed 200 bits for representation, sort of got represented back in the original data at the beginning, right? So the best thing that I could ever happen to, could ever happen to me on a channel is if I could just basically take my brown data such as it was, replicate it, add a hundred bits of zeros, that the noise would compress itself and in the most obliging way stick itself at the end of my transmission, like that's not going to happen, right? Otherwise, we would be out of a job as as, uh, as comms engineers, but that's the best thing that could happen. And if that happened, then what I would be able to do is I would be able to just look at the beginning and read off the original data, the original brown data. There was, you know, 200, uh, 200 bits worth of it. And then I would just discard the remaining noise. Okay. In order for that to be possible, what I would need, what I need is I need this two to the n to be great to be able to fit in both the description of the data and the description of the noise. If I cannot fit in the description of the data and the noise, then somehow I'm now never going to be able to pull it apart. Okay. So this y here has to be able to fit in the data and the noise. So if I look here in the exponent, this means that one has to be greater than or equal to hn plus r, which means that r has to be less than 1 minus hn. And what is 1 minus hn? Again, because we're talking about binary, that is the capacitor. 
Okay, so this is the sort of simplest way you're ever going to see capacity. <laughs> okay, I think uh, this is where capacity comes from. It's like I have all I have all the space in the world, except I need to give up H n uh, H n bits for the description of the noise. I can't not give those up because otherwise I wouldn't be able to recover X from Y because if I'm able to recover X, I'm able to recover N. Right. So if I'm staring at Y and able to recover X, then it's a corollary of that that I was able to recover X because I can subtract X, uh, recover N, I can subtract X from Y, and there I have N. Okay. So Shannon's idea is actually going to get us to this capacity, to this 1 minus HN. So why don't we use it? Why do we have that big continuum of, uh, of um, developments in coding? There's two difficulties with it. Let's look at them separately. The first difficulty is the storage. Remember how I was building my code book? I was going into my bag of two to the 300 code words, and I was assigning to each of the possible two to the 200 messages a code word, and I was taking a note of it. I had to remember it. That's horrible, right? How am I going to re remember that many assignments? So if N say was a thousand bits, you know, 120 bytes, and the example that I was giving you is like whatever, 300 bits, but let's say and it's a thousand bits, then I would have to store 10 to the 277 strings assignments of, you know, messages to code words. Okay, so that's a nightmare. Second nightmare is at the receiver, remember that what, uh, what really was implied by, um, uh, by um, Shannon and then really made very clear by Gallagher is that I'm staring at the Y and I look at each and every possible X and I go over each and every possible X, compute the conditional probability and pick the one that gives me the highest conditional probability. That's the maximum likelihood. I would have to go through 10 to the 277 possibilities. So storage is impossible, computation is impossible. Okay, the first part is actually not impossible. So remember that I mentioned a uh, little while ago that, you know, block codes basically took those, you know, uh, length uh, 200 uh, bit strings and turned them into those length 300 bit strings by uh, by a matrix multiplication. It turns out that I can achieve the same behavior as the uh, as the um, as the Shannon random codes if I use a random linear code. OK, and this has been known since the late 60s, early 70s. This was proven by Gallagher. What that means is I don't need to keep track of exactly what was mapped to what. I can just keep a single matrix, a linear generator matrix, which is chosen randomly so that I can take my length 200 bits, I can multiply by a linear generator matrix, get my 300 bits out, and that one matrix describes the entire code book. So the storage has not been a problem for a while, okay? So basically 1948 of these random codes, random linear, and I'm putting here in light color, the code constructions that were not considered practical. Okay, so basically at this point, the reason we're doing all this, since we've known for a while that we can do random linear uh, codes, the reason I'm doing all this is because of the complexity of the decoding, right? So the second part, the computation part remains. Okay, now, what do we generally do? Well, generally we make the engineering very much uh, look like the math. And what do I mean by we make the engineering look like the math? Remember we had this noise, uh, which has this certain entropy. You know, in a lot of systems, uh, the entropy of the noise is really, really low because the bit flip probability, the uh, bit error rate is only like 10 to the minus three, you know, something like that, which means that that channel capacity, which is one minus HN is very high, is above 0.9. If instead you look at, say, the new radio in the 3GPP5 5G standard, you look at these really long codes, so much, you know, much even longer than the ones I've, I've, I've been describing this, you know, uh, putative example, and the rates are really low, they're like 0.2, you, you know, you barely ever get to 0.9. The decoders are always very specific to the codes. Sometimes the decoders are even specific to particular rates of the code, right? So if it's two thirds, like I showed you in, in the example, if it's three quarters or something else, even then you might have different ones. And you also 
massage the signal to make the channel or payer ID. Uh, in, uh, and, and basically what happens is you're trying to remove any signs of dependence, temporal dependence in your noise, okay? So why would I want the noise to be uh, independent, identically distributed? I don't really want it to be independent uh, IDs just because I, you know, I don't know really generally how to code for that, right? There are theoretical ways of doing it, but they, they're not very easy to reduce to practice in general. So the approach that we're taking today is to guess a random additive noise decoding approach. And um, the idea is rather than making the engineering look like a math of averaging, which is you know the idea that um, came with um, Shannon's construction, even though we don't use Shannon's construction because of the complexity, we still use these ideas of basically having a long end to have a concentration to the mean, okay? So what we're going to look at is high rate, that's to say moderate redundancy, and it doesn't mean that the codes are necessarily short uh, or that they're necessarily high rate. It just means that the overall redundancy, the repair bits, are a moderate number. We'll see that visually later. I want to have flexibility. Uh, I want to have an efficient, accurate decoder for all codes. I don't want to have a receiver that has a different uh, a different piece of hardware for each and every code, and the thing looks like, you know, so summary enough. And going back to the motivation, I want to have low latency. That's to say, I don't want to have a long code for the purpose of trying to bump up my rate, because, you know, that's what I've been taught from classical information theory, especially when we look at the rates that we're getting and then not exactly anything to write home about. Okay, those are not very good rates. So I'm going long with the hope of bumping up my rate and I'm still not doing very well. Okay, so I'd like to control the code length. I'd like to make the code only as long as it has to be. And we'll talk a little bit also about avoiding interleaving. That's to say, not artificially making the, the uh, the system look at, uh, like it has ID noise if I don't have to. So we're going to make the math look like the engineering. We're not going to make the engineering look like the math. Okay, we're not going to go back to Shannon to make it look like, like the math. We're going to go back to Shannon in different ways. Okay, so what does the theory tell us actually about short code? So here's a very nice, uh, some nice curves out of a GitHub repository from my um, from my colleague, uh, colleague Yuri Polyansky, it's called uh, Spectre, and he has a nice, he has curated bunches of different bounds, never mind too much what the bounds are, uh, but basically here's capacity, here's code length, and here's an upper bound to achievable rate, and here are different uh, theoretical lower bounds. I mean theoretical lower bounds is that they don't come with an actual construction that you could implement, okay? So here's the case where I have a probability of bit flip P of 10 to the minus two, here 10 to the minus three, oops, and my block error rate is uh, here 10 to the minus two, 10 to the minus three. That's to say the code, the probability of decoding incorrectly, my goal is that it be uh, uh, about the same as P. And that's a reasonable, you know, rule of thumb. I mean, of course you can, you know, different regimes, but having a block error rate, which is roughly like the bit error rate, is a reasonable rule of thumb. Remember, if I had a code here of length 100 and I have a probability 10 to the minus 2 of a, of a bit flip, it really means that over, over a length 100 code, a code word, if I didn't have a code, the probability just by a union bound of having a mistake in that 100 bit sequence would actually be close to 1. Okay, so we want to bring it from one back down to say, uh, so in this 10, 10 percent, wanted to bring it back down to 0.1 to, percent. Uh, Here at 100, if I had 10 to the minus two probability of a bit flip, uh, it would be close to one probability that something in the sequence was wrong, and therefore I want to bring it back down to 10 to the minus two. Okay, so uh, that's what the theory tells me. Uh, but I told you that these are these bounds are theoretical bounds. What codes do I actually have? Well, I have classic codes like Reed Mueller, Reed Solomon. We'll maybe look at some uh, Bose Chaudhary Hockenheim codes later, you know. So there's this beautifully uh, constructed library of codes. Um, 
and these are, you know, carefully, carefully uh, designed codes, and they generally don't appear at every length. Sometimes they don't appear at every rate. Uh, these are uh, CRC aided polar codes, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, again in, in uh, later in the talk. Um, and there are ways of maybe filling in some of these other, uh, uh, some of these other uh, missing, you know, you have this huge white space here in your design space. Uh, it's called, um, you, you know, so, so, so basically it's called puncturing and it's, it's as messy as it sounds. You, you make holes uh, and it's, you know, it's very much an art. You often lose something with it. I'm not going to go into it, but, you know, it's, it's messy and it's extremely ad hoc generally. What about the codes that Gallagher told us? Those those random linear codes that do the same uh, as capacity achieving as the as the original random codes of Shannon. Well, there you know the world is your oyster. You can have any old code you want, any length, uh, any rate. It's random. You know you pick it. You you know you you can do whatever you want. Okay, so let's get to Grant. I've been sort of giving you a, a little bit of a. Um, uh, a tour of uh, of information theory because I know people have different backgrounds. This is an IEEE general talk. Let's go into Grant. So remember that I had the x that I'm transmitting, which in my example uh, was of length 300, uh, but there were only two to the 200 possibilities because I had an r of uh, of two thirds. And then I have the noise now. What is the H of the noise? Well, I just told you, you know, the bit flip probably is say around 10 to the minus three. So if my bit flip probably is 10 to the minus three, my H is actually also by just a simple Taylor series expansion of around 10 to the order 10 to the minus three. So what that means is that if my N is a thousand, uh, NH is one. Okay, so even though it looks exponential and it is, it's it's really nothing. There's very, very few possibilities for the noise, okay, on average. So this is how grand works. I'm gonna take the Y, and as opposed to doing uh, the staring at the Y by looking at each and every possibility of X and the maximum likelihood calculation, because remember, there are a lot of Xs, okay? Even if my R is lower than capacity, and of course, as my R gets closer to capacity, there's more and more of them, there's a lot of excess. So rather than look at the big, the big space of possible transmissions, I'm going to look at the little space of possible noises, probabilistically little space. I'm going to look at the Y. I take the Y and I'm going to say, what is my most likely noise? Now, part of the nice thing about having a noise which has a very small a probability of a bit flip is that the distribution of the noise is highly, highly asymmetric. Okay, basically, you're much more likely to have no noise at all uh, than you are to have, say, next comes, you know, just one or any one particular uh, bit in, uh, with a bit flip or two bit flips, etc. And you can compute these different probabilities. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, guess what the most likely noise effect is, not really the noise itself, and this will be important when we looked at soft information, because remember, I don't actually care about the noise, I care about X. So let's look at the most likely noise effect, okay? Uh, let's subtract it, then, so my ZN is my most likely noise effect, I'm going to subtract it, that's what this minus little circle means, so think of the plus as being, you know, the plus over maybe whatever finite field, and the minus is the minus over that finite field, I'm going to subtract that effect of the noise from the Y. I'm going to check whether that's a valid code word, one of my 2 to the 200 possibilities out of all the 2 to the 300 um, possible code words, uh, possible strings. And if it is, that is actually my maximum likelihood. Okay? So I'm not depending on any way on some clever construction of the code in the decoding, okay? So I keep asking until it comes with a check. So that's what our, our, little, our little logo here is, okay? This part here is the redundancy. I cannot get rid of it. I cannot have less than that redundancy because remember the example that I gave you is even if the noise was, you know, incredibly well behaved and just went to the back of the transmission just to stay out of the way of the bits, I still need to devote, I need to sacrifice some bits to it. Okay, 
So let's go back. Let's go back to these uh, to these uh, curves from Spectre by by my colleague uh, Yuri Polianski. Um, again, these are you know uh, best achievable bounds. These are upper bounds. So you know I cannot do. Uh, you know, the best I could do is somewhere between the blue and the red. And I'm going to show you that we can do this purple using red. Now, remember that I showed you before that normal codes don't have all those possibilities, right? Normal codes are few and far between in terms of what they can do. So how are we going to fill in all of these points? And actually, we can fill in all but the whole line. I'm going to use a random code, okay? So up until now, random linear codes, which are available at every rate and great in theory, basically remained really as an ontological uh, tool because there was nothing you could do with them. You couldn't decode the thing. Remember the two to the, you know, the 10 to the 277, how are you going to do that? But now I'm looking at the noise. So I actually don't care. Uh, I don't care about uh, the code. I just need to be able to check quickly that something is a code word or not. And as long as I have a linear code, remember that's represented just by a matrix, I can do so. Okay. At this point, usually people go, all right, okay. I believe that you can do uh, bit flips, but how are you going to do grand when you have a uh, soft information, when you have a continuous uh, noise, because when you have a continuous noise, you have a ton of different possibilities for the noise because it's continuous. Even if you quantize it, you know, it's just going to be a dizzying number of, of possibilities. And, you know, you, you, that, that whole, the whole trick around grand was that, you know, you didn't, that two to the NH wasn't that big. But remember, the trick was not so much how many different noises I had. It was how many different noise effects I have. Okay. So, it's not so much the noise per se, it's what is the effect of the noise. All right. So um, one of the things that people do is um, they, they look at the, the signal that was received, which I'm showing here, you know, um, by a little squiggly line. So that's the continuous signal was received. Uh, and they get some floating point information and they incorporate that into the decoding. So the different ways of incorporating, I mentioned uh, polar codes, one of the CRCA to polar codes, so-called CA polar. Uh, what, they, what is done there is you look at the continuous information, you demodulate it, that's to say, you, you know, you map it uh, to a discrete set of possibilities, but you keep some information as to what happened during that mapping. So a continuous information, and you make use of it in your decoding. Um, what uh, what uh, CA polar codes uh, do is, you know, you you rather than making a single mapping maximum likelihood, like I told you that um, that uh, Shannon originally suggested, what they do is instead they pick the top few, right? So not a single, but a, a whole bunch of top candidates, and then they winnow down that list of candidates using a cyclic redundancy check code, basically a hash that enables you to figure out which one was actually a, a code word. Now, what we're doing is we're always considering the code word as a hash. The code book is just a hash, right? Because a code book is only there to verify whether something is valid or not. So our entire, our entire decoding is only around checking hashes, okay? So we in particular, since this whole thing, this is linear and this is linear, so the CRC and the polar code, if you put them together, they're linear code. The fact that one part was polar, the other part was CRC, I really don't care, okay? I just need a hash. So I can use this code, I can use any code, and I can do a soft decode. Uh, one of the things that we showed uh, with our, our uh, Ken and I showed with our, with our student, uh, Amit Solomon, is that you actually can use uh, uh, with soft grant, you, you can actually do, you can actually show what the, what the maximum likelihood decoder is. You, you can actually compute it. Okay. So definitely if you're working in decoders, I would urge you to compare it with S grant. Uh, I don't think S grant is what I would put in a chip. It's, um, you know, it's, it's great for just offline computation. And again, remember, this is something that nobody knew how to do. And now we actually have the solution. This is the maximum likelihood. Okay, so I would definitely strongly argue if you're doing a different decoder, at least you need to show how far off it is from the theoretical optimum because now you can compute the theoretical optimum. So, you know, since last year. Uh, but, you know, S grant, 
while you know tractable for offline it, you know i don't it, it's not it's not what i would try to do online um orb grant which uh was uh, developed by, by ken duffy uses an approximation of s grant which is actually using ordered reliability bits uh, and that one is actually very tractable okay uh so it's again codebook independent but it's uh, it's a different way of quantizing the soft information but you can use the full soft information okay i told you that our idea is not so much about short codes, high rate codes, but really around moderate redundancy codes. And here's here's an indication of this. So this is very different from the way from the traditional way of thinking of of um, of coding, right? Usually you think you fix the length and you look at the rate, uh, like I showed you for the short codes, or you fix the rate and you look at block, block error probability as you increase the length. I mean, you know, we always think of rate and length and rate and length. But I want you to start thinking not so much of rate and length, but really more around amount of redundancy. Okay. So here, the idea is that I can go, if I go to longer blocks, I actually have to go with a higher rate because. What I want is just, I don't want to have too much redundancy. Why do I not want to have too much redundancy? I don't want to have too much redundancy because if I have a lot of redundancy, it means I have to do a lot of guessing, okay? So what we want is moderate redundancy. So these are now, you can see that I, I want to be in this region up here. So this is, again, very counterintuitive if you're coming from, from coding. We're used to thinking of coding as getting harder as the rate goes up. That's not what's happening here, okay? It, the, it's actually, it, as you get, get to longer lengths, you actually want the rate to go up, okay? So again, because we're not looking at the X, but we're looking at the N, a lot of our intuition is flipped, okay? And you can see here, this is the log of the block error rate, so the, the, the error rate that uh, that we want to have on the uh, on the code word. And, you know, as I mentioned, we usually want to be, you know, somewhere here, say, around minus three. So somewhere in this region is where we want to be. Okay. Okay, so I mentioned to you that what we do is we're really just using the code as a hash. And I mentioned to you that CRCs are a hash. Right, remember, so the CA polar code uh, was, you know, first decoding a list, you know, it was doing a, a list of uh, possibilities from the polar code, and then it was selecting from that list using a CRC as a hash. Polar codes without the CRCs don't do very well. So here you can see, here's the a polar code um, um, using uh, uh, successive cancellation, which is the original uh, approach proposed by Eric Kahn. Uh, and you can see here, this is what happens when you use orb grant. So remember, orb grant is basically works like uh, full soft grant. So it's it's uh, basically as good as optimum. And as you can see, of course, um, you know the the original theoretical approach is is basically optimum. But the code's not so good. So this is EB over n zero, which is a measure of, in effect, uh, it's it's a proxy for for that incorporates both signal to noise ratio and amount of redundancy. So generally, what you would like to have is you would like to, to have a block error rate, which is as low as possible for a particular EB over N0. Um, this is the CRC uh, put with a, uh, with 24 unit, uh, 24 bits of CRC, a polar code taken out of the um, 5G new radio 3GPP standard. Uh, this is um, with a list size of 16. So that means that when, you know, that polar CA polo decoder worked. It took 16. Uh, it took a list of 16, and out of those 16, it was uh, there was a selection. By the way, the decoding does not scale well with the list size. Generally, the decoding gets exponentially more difficult as the list size grows. So 16 is actually pretty big list size. Okay, and you can see that we do much better. Um, you can also see what happens if I have 11 bits of uh, of uh, CRC with a polar code. Uh, and you can see that there, um, both the, the state of the art with lit 16 and uh, the grand decoder, the orb grand decoder do the same. And you can also see here what happens if I put all of my bits into CRC and it all does the same. So pretty much everything does the same. You can just have a CRC by itself. 
you can have a CRC for the polar. The polar is basically irrelevant. You just don't want to have it all polar because polar somehow is not good. Um, but that's it. Pretty much as long as you don't choose something that's constructed to be not good, like polar by itself, anything works. A CRC, a CRC with a polar. Now, again, here, remember, I'm not using the CRC to, to select from among a possibility of different code words. I'm just using the CRC as a check. And I'm using the CRC 24 polar or CRC 11 polar also just as a check. I'm not using the fact that it's polar in any way. It's just a check. Here's with somewhat fewer bits. Same thing. The polar by itself doesn't do well. The CRC with the polar, um, the state of the art doesn't do so hot. Uh, we, we do, of course, much better. But also you could just have to use a CRC by itself with the same length. It just does the same. Okay. So basically, you know, the question here. Is it the code or is it the decoder? I would argue that unless you choose a really structured code that's messing you up, like the polar code here, pretty much anything works, okay? Anything works. What about channel burstiness? Remember I told you generally codes are really built for having this sort of independent noise and I didn't go into it, but of course uh, many of you in the audience know uh, that uh, codes are often designed in order to have certain hamming distances, right? So the minimum distance uh, between two code words is considered to be uh, an intrinsically important measure of, um, of performance of code words, because that's how much noise it takes to get you from one code word and to, to transport you to a different code word via the noise, that's to say, to cause an error. Now, that view, that Hamming distance view, which we take as being somehow uh, intrinsic, as I mentioned, is not intrinsic at all. It's, a mo it, it's actually a derivative of an ID noise model. If your noise is not ID, then the hemming distance is for the birds, right? Like who cares about the hemming distance? It, nobody does, like it doesn't mean anything. Uh, so actually, if your noise is more bursty, what would happen is you have more structure in the noise and the more structure in the noise you have, the easier it is to guess. So actually by breaking up the structure and the noise and making the guessing as, as difficult as possible, so I should, if I have structure in the noise, I should leave it there because any structure aids, simplifies my guessing, uh, you know, sort of targets my space of exploration. Uh, and instead, if you look at, you know, traditional decoders, so I mentioned uh, both, uh, both Chaudhary Hockenheim codes, BCH codes, earlier in the talk, here's an example of BCH. And, you know, uh, the, um, the Burleycamp Massey decoder, for, which is shown here in, uh, in Turquoise is a fantastic decoder. You can see that it does, uh, you know, it does, uh, it does as well as, as Grant. Um, but this is Grant with Markov order. This is work we did, uh, uh, Ken and I did with our student Wayan. But uh, you can see that, you know, if you hadn't had a, an actual ID noise, you had the same amount of, you know, the same number of bit flips, but a more, more bursty, with, you know, with a Markovian uh, behavior, uh, the poor Burley Camp Massey decoder would get worse and worse. But actually, Grant, unless it gets really out of whack and it's like basically there's noise everywhere, and and this this effect here is because you know the, the bit flip probability is such that like your entire code word would be would be messed up. Uh, basically, what happens is the the uh, the more uh, the more uh, bursty you are, the better off you are. Okay, so it's again channel burstiness is not something to discard; is actually something to keep. So, and if I had had to interleave to make it all even, um, the interleavers usually add a delay factor of about a hundred, uh, and so here we're getting a power factor of two and a delay factor of a hundred. So remember my initial uh, my initial contention that you were adding more that you are adding more spectrum to go to do things, stupid things faster and with more energy. You are having to go add more spectrum to go a hundred times faster than you actually needed to. And you are adding more energy, you know, by a factor of two. Okay. So here's the vision is to make the engineering look like the math um, and to focus on the current engineering need. 
uh, we just put a little web page, which I definitely encourage you to go visit. Um, it has a high level introduction. It has papers. Uh, and we'll be updating it with more content uh, as time goes on, especially now that classes are over, almost over, almost over. Um, uh, I hope we hope to be adding more content, Ken and I. So with that, uh, I will stop sharing and um, take your questions. Marielle, thank you very much for uh, such an amazing presentation. And grant itself is, you know, it's already uh, very exciting as it is. Um, so I will have to ask from the audience that um, if you have any questions, please write them in the Q&A box. Unfortunately, Cisco WebEx allows only uh, mute all or unmute all features. So I don't want to unmute everybody at once. Uh, it will be a lot of cha channel burst. Uh, well, that's right. This is so. not a good. I mean, this is not coded, so this is not <laughs> a good. <laughs> exactly. So, right. um, in order to avoid it, uh, let's uh, use the Q and A box, and um, we will be moderating the questions to Muriel. Oh, I see friends too, David. David, bonjour. <laughs> Um, so, while they're uh, preparing the questions, maybe I can start asking you a couple of them. Um, so, I have uh, noticed uh, when talking about CRCs for polar codes, are those only hash functions associated with polar codes um, that's of our interest? I, can you repeat your question? So, do you mean for the polar codes or the way we use them? Uh, the way we use them uh, in the C polar I codes. Yes, so, in effect, you, you know, in grand or in the polar code, sorry, um, in the polar, in the traditional polar decoder or in grand? Um, so, in traditional polar decoders, um, yes. CRCs, as you said, beautifully, they, they can uh, serve as a hash function. Yes. Which is, which is poorly used, I agree, that's uh, like for error detection. Uh, only, um, but for, for using it for grant purposes, um, are those the only hash functions that we rely on to? Uh, so we can we can decode polar decoders with grant, right? P anything you grant. can decode anything. So uh, the fact is that see a polar code with a CRC is just a linear code, right? So yes, you have a pole. You know, you have one matrix. You have another one. You multiply them, all you got yourself is a matrix. The fact that one came from polar and the other one came from CRC, and maybe you had a third one that came from your kitchen drawer, eh, who cares, right? <laughs> they just These are just matrices, they multiply each other, it comes a matrix. So Grant doesn't care. It doesn't care about the structure of the code at all. It doesn't even care whether it's a linear code or not. It just cares that you can check whether something's a code word or not. So what we do is we don't separate the C, the CRC part from the polar part. We just check all at once if it's if it's a code word or not. We we don't need to separate it. Exactly, exactly. And uh, we can also take advantage of the frozen bits because somehow they also serve as some parity check bits and the uh, natural uh, and frozen bits and polar codes. They also we don't need to. A... Yeah, we don't need to. It's. I mean, the whole the whole polar decoder is. It, I don't. I don't have to do anything. Yes, that's what I wanted to. Uh, yeah, nothing. I don't. I don't have to do anything. It's. Um, it's. It just doesn't. How do I say? It doesn't matter what the code is. The code is just something where I go and I go, all right, is this a code word or not? You know, so the fact that it was obtained through, you know, a clever construction, a stupid construction, a random construction, I don't care. I just go, are you a code word? Yeah, and, so that's you know, as simple as yeah. this. So I'm not taking it. I don't need to. I, I'm not using the CRC, and again, it's really, really, really different from what people are used to, but I'm not using it to, um, I, I'm not using it to subselect from a list. I'm not freezing bits. I'm not doing anything. I'm just 
um, uh, I'm just I'm just using the code as a as really as a hash, which means that you know my design space is huge. That's why those random codes do so well. By the way, those random codes, they're not even selected by doing a few selections. Okay. Yes. It's selected at random, like the first code that the computer gives you is better than the state of the art. Yes. <laughs> Which is like, you know, like it's like the slacker approach to coding, you know. <laughs> My yes, usual approach to engineering. <laughs> exactly, and that's the simplicity of it, actually. Uh, that yeah. uh, attracts yeah. here. Uh, yep. Thank you uh, for That's right. uh, so uh, we have a couple of questions coming. We have uh, one yes, from... I see questions. I can't. I I see that they're question marks, but I do not see the question. <laughs> I, I I can read them for you if you want. Oh, okay. Where do you see them? There's a Q and A. a oh, box I'm see. I'm sorry. I hadn't again. All right. Okay, I see them. Okay. Sashin, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Thanks for coming. Lars, conventional techniques can bring you quite close to your theoretical capacity bound. Am I right in understanding grand achieves the same with lower complexity and latency? So that's a good question, Lars. So grand is a maximum likelihood decoder. So, uh, it, you know, as long as your redundancy is within that sort of range that I showed you, so the redundancy is not too high, then the grand will match or outperform any decoder because it's optimum. So for as long as the, the total number of redundancy is not too high, then, then it, it will do at least as well. Does that answer your question, Lars? Uh, oh, I see the questions. Okay, they're coming fast and furious. All right. Uh, I can't see if, if I answered the question properly or not, because, all right, next question. Um, so Lars, oh, Tashin, you, you weren't just saying thanks, you were asking a question. For grand decoding of RLCs, is there an optimum for the code length? So it's not so much the, it's actually not the code length. It's really just the number of redundancy bits that's most important. Okay. So I, I hope I answered your question, Tashin. Uh, uh, John Voron, ML is increasing use more for machine learning maximum likelihood these days. Yes, I know, I know. And actually, I, I am co-teaching machine learning this, <laughs> this term to undergrads. <laughs> but you know, what can you do? What is your take on the impact of ML on decoding solutions? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I think there might be interesting things to do if you're trying to learn the structure of the code. But certainly given just for everything that I showed you, there was no machine learning. I mean, you know, the decoding is so easy. There's no learning to be done. There might be some interesting learning to be done on statistics of the noise, I think. That I think would be really, really interesting. Uh, okay. Sayed. Yes, Sayed. Okay. Oh my gosh, it's a multi-part. Oh, it's one, no, it's two. Oh, okay, sorry. Give me a second. Oh, Lars, yes, thanks. Okay, fantastic. Uh, okay, now, Sayed. Hello, Professor Muir. I'm postdoctoral research at McGill. In collaboration with Professor Warren Gross, I've designed a few hardware architectures. Oh, gosh. It's like when I'm reading it, people are putting in questions. <laughs> I can totally do this. No, I can't. I'm really not doing a good job. Uh, for various grand variants, fantastic. I'd like to ask you two questions about grand. Grand is widely viewed as a powerful ML decoder for short and high rate codes. Is it possible to expand grand for longer codes with affordable complexity? The answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, again, it's a matter of the redundancy, it's not a matter of the length. Part two, <laughs> part one, part two. Grand has the incredible capability of adjusting to test error pattern generation based on channel parameters. That's right. And I think that that's basically going back to the question I think John asked about machine learning. I think there will be interesting things there to learn the, the, the noise. And this test error pattern generation can be tailored for a particular channel. Is it possible to generate universal test patterns for grant for various communication channels, models, Edivision, Rayleigh, Reich, and fading channel with memory? So I just showed you a channel with memory with uh, with Markov. 
uh, order, okay? And we, we are doing some work, uh, and AWGN, as you also showed you, that organ was also AWGN, because again, I care about the effect. Um, we have some stuff on Bailey Bryson, but I'm, I, don't, I don't have it ready to present. Uh, okay, that now, Hesham, hey Hesham, how you doing? Just saying hi to Hesham. Can we use grand in six H? I think you mean six G. But you know, I think it's yeah, but it's, yeah, five is what six was comes after is what comes after after five and H is what comes after G. So that's fair enough. Um I hope so. I hope so. I, I, I hope that people are gonna move, you know, just move to low redundancy codes that are close to capacity that don't have to be super long and uh, and that they're not going to want to have their transceivers look like, you know, like a Swiss Army knife. So I'm definitely hoping so. Okay, I think I made it through all the questions. I make it through. Oh, no, sorry, I have not. Uh, there was another question that I missed. Uh, Hossein. Thank you, Professor Meadow, for your presentation. When guessing a code word, what are some practical considerations for ranking the most likely noises? Uh, E.g. efficiency, memory, yeah. That's a really good point. That's a really good point, I'm saying. So, um, you, you know, uh, it, it basically really depends on, you know, like I showed you, Orgram is super, super easy um, for, for soft information. Um, in some cases, you may not need to actually have it all in memory. You may be able to do it on the fly. We actually have a chip that does it on the fly. Um, and I know Warren uh, Gross, uh, Professor Gross and his group have, have done a, a design for a somewhat different um, uh, approach of, uh, more towards memory that also does the, 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 the generation of patterns on the fly. So you may not actually need to um, to store the patterns, you know, you can definitely generate them on the fly. If you have soft information, you're basically taking them in and you just generate them from the soft information. Uh, okay, did I answer everybody? Uh, sometimes they seem like they're rotating again. Okay, I think, did I not, is there anything I did? Oh, Saida, thank you. For, oh, oh, there's also in the chat. Confusing. All right, let me go to the chat. So, okay, how many? Yes, there are a lot oh, of questions. Are you chat. there? Okay, can anybody make my other users? Okay, okay. Saida, can how can we improve the performance of network coding using machine learning? Um. So I didn't really cover that here. Uh, but you know I. Happy to talk about it offline, but you know, because I don't want to bore people with something which is not in the the topic of the um, of of the of the um, uh, presentation today. Since people probably came thinking they're going to hear about grant, I'm, I'm sorry. Send me an email. Send me send me an email, Saida. So from Carlo Condo, if we stick to ID noise, is grant? Oops. Okay. If we stick to ID noise, does grant then especially benefit from code constructions that result in high minimum distance? Uh, would that be the reason that, for example, polar only grand decoding is not grand? It's not that the polar only grand decoding is not great. It's that the code is bad. It's not, it's not the decoder. <laughs> Let me just go back. But it's, it's, uh, it's not, it's, not that the decoder is not good. Let me go back to let me see that works. Yes. You, you guys see it? Yeah. Oops. The decoder is fine. The decoder is optimum, as a matter of fact. It's just the the code is not good. Um, and you know the random code. It's not designed with distance in mind. I mean, you know, I don't know. I mean, you ask a good question about, you know, whether they can be, when we can re revisit the distance. But again, as I said, distance is very much a sort of a side effect of the ID noise. But of course, you, you mentioned that. So yeah, the problem is not with the decoder. The problem is just the code is, is weird. 
and you know yeah uh, i don't know if that answered your question okay sorry um so i'm going down the chat I'm seeing some private uh, texts that are, I, I think, accidentally not okay. public. Okay. Um, let me see. All right. So, um, okay. So, yeah, because let me see. Let me extend the Q&A again. Okay. Yeah. So, maybe you can pull them off the private. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, Actually, they're the replications of the same questions, except uh, someone, Zibek, uh, says, I have to leave, but thank you for this MIT introduction. Thank we you. A lot of more research on the MIT website. Um, we have Alirza Morselli asking, thank you, uh, Professor Madar, could you please share the link of the grant website again? Oh, yeah, of course. Sorry about that. Uh, let me share again. There we go. Yeah. Thank you. It's a grant decoder. Thank you. Uh, we have John Vron uh, saying thank you so much uh, for your engaging talk and discussion and virtual applause. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions from the uh, existing panelists? Uh, you can. Feel free to unmute your microphones and ask your questions if you wish. Okay, I think maybe we were all questioned out. <laughs> um, I think so. Um, Fantastic. Well, maybe, okay, I, I can ask one question. One question. Okay, Muriel, uh, uh, thank you very much for your for your you know the uh, you know the uh, very informative presentation. Actually, I'm not expert in the field, so I just really ask a question maybe from us uh, from uh, us as an outsider, I would say. Fantastic. Um, Those are often uh, the best ones, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, my question is because you actually in the beginning of your presentation you talk about the low latency. Okay, that's that's uh, the uh, one of the most important features we want to add in the 5G eventually in 6G too. So uh, the okay from the most of the let's say for from a hardware implementation point of view, uh, low latency for us is mean that's a broadband because broadband I mean we can have the you know short pulse. Okay. So that, that's the more or less like a correlation between the time scale and the frequency scale. Um, but on the other hand, from information point of view, which means that you have more information to, to handle because of the uh, broadband. Um, so this, I don't know whether this creates a burden on the recording side uh, because of the broadband signals, broadband data. So. Uh, Let's say right now the 5G one to everybody try to compress up to, let's say, uh, down lower than five millisecond. So do we have any particular, let's say, thoughts on this uh, in terms of the reduction of the time, okay, and also, uh, and also the burden on the coding side, whether there's any compromise, because there's a, you know, all the things related to the from a hardware point of view, we want to have the broadband, but on the other hand, you create a burden on the coding maybe. I don't know, because in the beginning you talk about this, it's, a, it's, it's yeah. kind of a correlation issue, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great question. Uh, so I think that, as I mentioned, part of the reason people are going to higher frequencies is in order to reduce delay not just to get more throughput, right? I mean, throughput right. and delay are actually not the inverse of each other, okay? When, I, when, when people ask me, well, you know, isn't, isn't higher throughput mean lower delay? I said, you know, you need enough throughput and then you need low delay. So, you know, a lot of people been stuck at home have, have gone off and, you know, gotten like a meal services, right? Like these, these services where they, they bring you a, a, a fantastic, you know, 
a box of fresh food every week. Now, if you bought it for the year, you expect that you're going to have 52 weeks worth of food, right? That's your throughput, 52 oh. deliveries of food. And if you get less than 52, you had insufficient throughput, you know, that wasn't good enough. Delay means that you actually want that food delivered every week, say every Wednesday. Okay. Now, what's happening now is because we're doing a lot of inefficient things, which Grant is trying to, you know, alleviate. Um, what's happening is people say, well, look, um, I'm getting my 52, uh, I'm getting enough throughput, I'm getting, you know, 52 deliveries of boxes of food, but what's happening is I get my, my boxes of food every two weeks. So every two weeks I get two boxes of food. So then by the end of the, 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 the week of the delivery, but you know, one week after delivery, the food's no good. Okay. So what do people do? They go, I know what I will do. I will get a second service, which I'm going to interleave with the first one. So every two weeks I get two boxes of food from the service and the other weeks I get two boxes of food. That's what we're doing by putting more resources, by putting higher bandwidth, right? We're mm -hmm. over provisioning in bandwidth, which is boxes of food, because my delivery service was screwed up. Okay, because mm -hmm. my delivery service had too much delay. So if now somebody came and said, hey, you're a, guess what? I can get you 52 boxes of food. Now you only needed 52 boxes of food. You weren't going to eat more, right? Your application only needed so much data. It just needed it faster. Okay. Yeah. So rather than now I can half your cost and by half the cost means also your electronics are going to be cheaper because I don't need to deliver food. I don't need to have two services, which is like, you know, double the bandwidth. In effect. So, as I mentioned, that's well, not the only reason why you're adding bandwidth, right? In some cases, you also need more throughput, right? So, okay, if now you need, you know, 100 boxes of food, you need 100 boxes of food, right? But again, then you shouldn't have to double it to get it on time. So, that's the inefficiency that I'm getting to about doing stupid things faster with more energy, right? So, at least, you know, at least. If, if I'm having to go to broader band and if I'm having to be more challenging my electronics, it should be that I'm really getting the full benefit, right? If I'm getting yeah. 100 box, whatever, you know, 104 boxes of food, it should be that I'm actually using 104 boxes of, that I really wanted that. Not that I'm getting 104 boxes of food to make up for the fact that I had a lousy delivery service. That's great, thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. All right. Do we have any other, uh, maybe final questions at this point? Uh, Don't see any in either the chat or the yeah. Q&A. Okay, fantastic. I'll thank just... you, thank you all for sharing your evening with me. Oh, uh, Amy, Amy want to maybe oh, say Amy. something. Go ahead, sorry, I can't. <laughs> it's okay. I... I just want to thank you so much for a lovely talk. Thank you. And uh, very, very informative and for joining us and really, really appreciate it. Thank you. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Bon. Bonsoir tout le monde. Merci d'être venu. Merci. Bon, merci beaucoup. Merci. Voilà. Okay. <laughs> d'accord. On se parle. Allez, bonne soirée. D'accord. Voilà. D'accord. Merci. Voilà. Voilà. Merci. Au revoir. Merci. Au revoir. Thank you very much, Maria, for. <laughs> It was a fantastic talk. Well done, Furkan. Thank you. Thank you for thank you. organizing. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating. Um, it's uh, been a memorable event, so thank you very much for tuning in today. <laughs>